there is almost no modern transportation tool as powerful as a high-capacity rail tunnel. From their earliest origins on the London Underground, underground railways have transformed our cities, moving fast electric high-capacity transportation below the surface. Unfortunately though, for a long time tunneling was an extremely dangerous and chaotic process, not the type of thing you want to be doing all over a city, much less all over the world. I remember the first time I learned about tunnel boring machines, the incredible beasts that allow us to create tunnels with assembly line efficiency, and how awestruck I was at their existence. These machines have been at the center of delivering so many massive and impactful tunnel projects, from the channel tunnel linking the UK and France, to subways and everything in between. They've taken something incredibly challenging, tunneling, and made it almost a normal happenstance. Because of this, it's been a real bucket list item for me to actually go check out a TPM firsthand, and so when I got the chance to do that a few weeks ago, I jumped at the opportunity. So let's go into a TBM and see how it works. Hey there, this is RM Transit, a channel about digging really big holes for trains. The tunnel boring machine we're looking at today is one of the two tunnel boring machines being used to bore the main Eglinton West extension tunnels. The Crosstown West is an extension of the almost ready to open, soon hopefully, Eglinton Light Rail Line, that more or less acts as a subway west of Laird Drive, with no road or pedestrian crossings and fare gates at all stations. Just west of the terminus of the main portion of Eglinton at Mount Dennis, the West Extension will see a short tunnel, then an elevated guideway over the Humber River Valley, and after that a much longer tunnel section that will take it to Renforth Drive. At Renforth we have the terminal station of the Mississauga Transitway, where GO, TTC, and Mississauga Transit services all meet. As Renforth is just within the boundaries of Mississauga, this project reminds me of the York Subway Extension, except instead of extending Line 1 to York Region, this project extends Line 5 to Peel Region. The York Subway gets a lot of criticism for being overbuilt and underused, but this project is better in almost every way. As I already mentioned, it will finally bring the TTC subway into Peel region, an area with much better transit service than York. It will also likely be extended to the airport in short order, as part of a project that's already being planned, which will bring a second rail line to Toronto Pearson. And not to mention, the line can eventually be extended all the way to the booming Mississauga city centre, as the transit way was explicitly designed for this purpose. And while the York subway uses large six-car trains, the much smaller tram-style vehicles used on Line 5 are probably going to be busy even without this major western extension. Ultimately, for huge parts of Brampton and Mississauga, this connection will finally enable fast, reliable, frequent service into Toronto for most of the day, every day. But to build the extension, we're building tunnels, and to build the tunnels, we need tunnel boring machines. So let's look at how this project is coming together. Arriving early in the morning, we started with the usual safety briefing, except this one was not so usual. Tunneling has got a lot safer, but it's still really dangerous. You have a giant machine working in an enclosed space, with high voltage power cables, tons of water, and all kinds of other hazards present. One of the biggest hazards is the risk of toxic gas, and to protect from that as well as other potential airborne hazards, there are all kinds of respirator units around the job site, which you may have to use at a moment's notice if there's a problem. Actually heading onto the site, the scale is simply enormous, afforded by the large suburban plot of land directly north of Renforth Transitway Station, which itself is just south of Toronto's main international airport. This actually makes the whole operation a lot smoother, as additional materials can be kept on site to keep work going even during disruptions. Sitting in front of us is a giant, semicircular muck pit into which the soil removed from the tunnel is deposited. Some have speculated online that the purpose of this is to allow soil to dry before it's shipped off, but the real reason is to be able to more easily test the soil for contamination before it's sent to its final destination, which will depend on its quality. Emptying into the pit is muck, carried on a series of conveyor belts that work their way into the tunnel and then several kilometers away to the actual tunnel boring machines. The machine depositing the muck moves to make it easier to distribute it for testing and hauling away. Also on the surface we see stacks of precast tunnel liners that are used to build the rings that form the tunnel. There's also a giant backup power generation system and dedicated power lines just for running the TBMs. Now this is an MSV. You might have seen other tunnel boring projects that use small trains to haul material and equipment to the TBM, but this project uses these multi-service vehicles that more or less act as bi-directional buses and trucks to take workers, tunnel segments, as well as other equipment into the tunnel. 
and from here we start our descent into the tunnel, beginning with the launch pit where equipment and personnel are organized and staged before entering, and where the tunnel boring machines were well originally launched, starting their tunneling journey east. Parts of this pit will likely make up the future Renforth subway station, which will rather uniquely be in an open trench with vertical walls, sort of like the Humber College station on the Finch Rail project we visited a while back. Once we're in the pit, we waste no time hopping into the MSV that'll take us to the boring machine. An important logistical note to make is that since the tunnel boring machine is traveling further and further away from the launch pit, and because the MSV is speed restricted, it takes quite a while to actually travel from the launch shaft to the tunnel boring machine, and we were easily rolling away for 15 plus minutes before we actually arrived at our destination. This particular machine we're looking at is named Rexy, after Toronto's Rexdale neighborhood, and was roughly under Richview Park just east of Martin Grove Road when we visited it. Rexy is actually one of two siblings, the other being Rennie, who is slightly further east and was launched first. The TBM launch pit isn't actually big enough to launch two TBMs simultaneously, and it's also beneficial to launch one TBM first so that it can act as a pilot, teaching the tunnelers much more about the local geology before the second tunnel is dug. Now, if you like me are curious what the tunnel around the TBM feels like, you get off the MSV onto the slanted side of the tunnel, and then you're greeted with the giant machine filling much of this space. There weren't any strong smells besides that of mud and concrete, and it actually wasn't as crazy loud as you might expect, though there are various electronic beeps and bloops and humming and rattling as the machine moves. What was quite noticeable was the temperature. When we arrived on the site in the morning, I was wearing several layers, but by the time I was walking through the tunnel boring machine, I was absolutely cooking, even after having taken my layers off. Which makes sense because again, tons of electronics and heavy machinery and an enclosed space. When you actually look at the tunnel boring machine from the back, you'll notice that there's space underneath it, and this is where the MSV can deliver tunnel segments. You can also see the giant rollers that the machine sits on that allow it to move forward through the tunnel. You'll also notice that there's a small amount of water running down the middle of the tunnel. This is normal, and the vast majority of water is being pumped out through a dewatering process. If you're curious about the giant yellow tube, well, that's for ventilation, and the light strip for awesome YouTube aesthetics, and also, well, light. Now, before we actually look at the rings being installed, we have to work our way through the TBM, which requires climbing a few ladders and squeezing through the narrow spaces left over on the sides of the machine. Though, if I'm going to be completely honest, it was not nearly as claustrophobic in here as I expected. The tunnel boring machines being used on this project have a rough diameter of 6.5 meters and are over 130 meters long, meaning you have to do quite a bit of walking and squeezing by equipment to get to the front. The length of the machine is largely just due to its complexity, there are a lot of different functions here that need to work in concert. One of the first major things we saw was the emergency chamber, which is meant to be used if workers are trapped in the tunnel for some reason, say a fire breaks out in the middle. The chamber is airtight and has enough oxygen and supplies to sustain 20 people for 24 hours, giving rescuers time to respond, although actually using it is absolutely a last resort. We also came across a worker monitoring the grout injection process, as high pressure grout is injected on the outside of the tunnel to stabilize it and seal it in. Going further forward, we could see the rings actually being delivered, at which point several workers unload them from the stack they arrive in and put them on a machine that takes them to the front of the TBM. Now, this is actually a special kind of tunnel boring machine, known as an earth pressure balance machine. This type of TBM is used in places like Toronto, where the soil is loose with lots of gravel and sand. This type of soil is traditionally very hard to dig through, because it has a tendency to collapse when you tunnel through it, or settle and cause sinkholes. The earth pressure balance machine, as its name suggests, uses a pressurized front cutter head to maintain pressure against the earth while it digs. However, this does make the machine more complicated. For example, when soil needs to be emptied onto the conveyor belt, it needs to first exit the pressurized area. Before we actually work our way to the front of the machine, I think it's worth taking a moment to discuss how a TBM actually works. The boring machine, as you've seen, is essentially a giant cylinder, with a cutting wheel at the front that slowly digs away at the soil. The cutting head is pressed against the earth by a series of hydraulic jacks, and by varying the pressure applied in each one, the machine can be steered. Those hydraulic jacks are actually putting pressure up against the already built tunnel walls, and once the jacks are fully extended, pushing the front of the TBM all the way forward, they can be pulled in and the segments are put together to form another ring which the TBM can then once again push off of. 
This cycle repeats again and again and again to build more and more tunnel. In fact, a lot of the complexity of the launch shaft is creating the structure for the TBM to initially push off of, while it doesn't have any tunnel to do so, while also getting the various segments of the machine all connected up, as they kind of trail the cutter head not unlike a giant caterpillar, as cliche as it is to say. Now, you might be wondering how the tunnel actually handles a corner. Sure, the TBM can apply more pressure on one side, but how can that work with cylindrical rings? In this case, the secret is actually having rings that aren't the same length all around. Instead, the ring shrinks approaching the last segment of the ring known as the keystone, from both sides. This means that depending on how you orient it, you can match the tunnel to the turn of the TBM. And if you want to go straight, you simply alternate the location of the keystone by rotating the ring so that the shorter length counteracts itself. At the front of the TBM, you might be wondering how the rings can be installed without having soil and water rush in. The answer here is that the rings are not placed against the soil, but rather against a shield, which has brushes at the end of it that are saturated with a thick and heavy grease that seals this part of the machine. Actually watching the rings being placed is quite awesome. The various machines are able to pick up the precast tunnel liners that make up the rings by using two holes in each one that match up with prongs on the erector and internal cranes. The actual grabbing is done via vacuum suction. To start, the erector operator moves a huge platform surrounding the core of the TBM backwards so they can grab a ring segment. Once a multi-ton ring segment has been picked up, they move the hydraulic jacks, move the entire platform forward, rotate the erector, and then one by one place the tunnel segments. To be clear, this is a 24 hour operation, and every day the machine is meant to move 10 to 15 meters forward, but the project is going really well, and so things are actually ahead of schedule. Watching the way the small number of workers running the TBM work together as a well-oiled machine is really impressive, and the whole TBM feels a lot more refined than you might imagine for an underground digging appliance. From the jacks we headed over to our last stop, which was a quick look within the TBM operating cap, containing a number of electronic systems that track how the machine is performing, but also determines how to place each ring. The cab was small, so you pretty much had to enter a single file and couldn't get past one another once in it, but not too small for some donuts, which were a nice touch. And after that, we were complete with our tour, and we started the rather long and toasty process of walking through the narrow winding passages of the TBM to wait for our rather long ride back to the surface. Going through the whole experience really shows the art and science of the whole tunnel construction process, and the scale of the TBM frankly took my breath away, even though I knew it was a gigantic machine going in. Now ultimately, we're going to need a lot more tunnels and tunnel boring machines for the transit-oriented future the world needs, so thanks for watching.